So, hey guys, I, I think I'll go ahead and begin. Uh, we have a we have a, a small group, uh, and I have no idea how I'm going to do uh, on this one. You guys, uh, if you've ever seen my presentations, I, I prefer to be very conversational. Right now, I'm talking to a camera, so uh, you know, feel free to toss questions in there. Uh, you know, raise your hand. Uh, I, I don't think I have a, a ton of content, and certainly everything that we'll talk about, you know, is uh i i think we'll easily be able to cover in the time allotted so um we're just gonna take it from there and uh you know like i said i i very much prefer this to be conversational the reason uh i'm giving this presentation is to show that uh you can also teach an open source class um it's actually not that hard i thought it was going to be impossible i thought there were going to be like a bunch of uh red tape and and hoops to jump through but uh you know, it turned out to work pretty easily and pretty straightforward. Uh, and ultimately the hardest part is the gift that I wanna give to you guys. And that is a curriculum to start from uh, because developing the curriculum can be pretty hard. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So by way of quick introduction, um, I'm Daniel. You can uh, reach me at the email address pretty much anytime on the screen if you have questions, comments. Uh, if you want to follow on, it's, you know, I don't mind, not at all. Uh, at work, I, I wear a vice president hat for network services at the uh, a small company you may have heard of. It's called MasterCard. Um, there I design and build our data center and core networks that will, you know, that does globally connect uh, all of our web presences and uh, a bunch of really interesting things. Uh, I grew up in the internet space as a web guy, started out as a pager jockey. Uh, on call and just kind of grew from there. Uh, but ultimately, I, you know, despite being an infrastructure guy, I'm very fond of code. I, I write code for fun. Uh, that's one of the things that got me involved at the ASF. It's one of the things that kind of uh, has kept my sanity during this COVID lockdown. Uh, if you look on my GitHub repo, you'll see that I've released, I think, four or five projects uh, since March because of uh, that exact thing. Um, I'm the, the last founding member of our open source program at MasterCard. Uh, just recently, though, we're, we're getting a lot of new attention and new interest uh, in open source within the organization. So I'm excited to see that uh, growing. Uh, for play, I mean, I, I'm involved at the ASF, uh, former member of the board. I'm VP fundraising, um, a member of the foundation, and I am uh, you know, my first love, I'm still engaged in the Apache HTTP server project. Uh, aside from that, you know, I, I love talking about open source. I love uh, maybe sharing some of the things that I've learned um, that maybe could potentially benefit uh, others. Uh, and you'll see that actually is a big motivation for why uh, I kind of did this sort of thing a couple of years ago. Uh, so diving right into it, let's talk about motivations. Like why would you or me or whoever want to give an open source class? Like wh what would you, uh, what would you, what would move you in that direction? And, and for me, the thing that really um, I think is helpful uh, is think about how you yourself learned about open source. How did you get engaged, right? Did you, did you have a mentor that, showed you the ropes, somebody that pointed you in the direction and said, hey, why don't you consider getting involved here? It looks good on your resume, or you can establish a really great network, or whatever the reasons. Uh, that should be motivation for you to do the same thing, right? Um, did you self-guide and maybe stumble or have some of the uh, some some challenges? That's another motivation, right? Maybe the next person shouldn't have to stumble, or maybe the next person would love to learn from the lessons you learned the hard way. Um, which is kind of the next one, right? We've all, I'd say we've all stubbed our toe in some way, shape or form, uh, engaging in open source or engaging in communities or even simple things just like, you know, contributing. Um, that's a great way uh, to motivate people, that, that not necessarily to motivate them to, to learn the hard way. Uh, but for me, if I learn something the hard way, I always try to think of 
uh, that next poor sap that is trying to uh, uh, do the same thing and, and hopefully doesn't have to learn it the hard way. The other thing, and, and I mentioned about this earlier, um, open source is a passion for me. I'm, I'm very happy to see that we as, uh, as an industry or as a movement or as whatever you'd want to call us today, uh, open source isn't necessarily a bunch of barefooted hippies that are you know, on the fringes of society. It's very clear that open source is here to stay. Uh, and that kind of passion that I have, uh, it, it continues fueling it. And what's, what's really interesting is because open source has entered the common lexicon, people have heard of it, people know a thing or two about it. Um, it's much more likely that you'd be able to latch on to that interest uh, to, to deliver your own passion, right? So for me, myself, I, I appreciate training and mentoring and teaching people. Uh, obviously, there's a, a philanthropic angle. Uh, it feels good to give back. And, and then building the community. Um, look, you know, I, I, I'm going to repeat a line from, uh, from Rich Bowen that he said a number of times. I have personally gotten so much more out of my involvement uh, with the Apache Software Foundation and with open source than I have ever received. So it, it's good to deliver that, right? It's good to, sorry, it, that I have ever given back. It's good to return that. Uh, and you know, it's interesting. Let me let me just use a, a quick word about um, the passion and, and about just sometimes you just gotta let things happen. Um, it was Apache Con Denver and what year was that? Maybe 2012? Uh, Somebody can toss it into the chat if uh, if they recall. And and we were actually uh, doing what's called an unconference. And an unconference is you know you just get together and you talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, what was really interesting while we were talking in the unconference, one of the individuals in the conference said, you know I didn't even hear about open source. I'd never heard it until after I graduated from university. And we all kind of took a step back and said, that's crazy. How does, you know, how does that happen? You know, we are living it. Uh, so, you know, that really struck me, really, really struck me. And it was kind of funny. Here's the circumstances. I came back to work after coming from Apache Con. And on that Monday, Monday sitting in my inbox was an email from the dean uh, of the uh, information systems um, department from my alma mater asking if I'd be willing to write a letter of recommendation. My, my college mentor was, uh, he, he was going up for tenure. Uh, he was being nominated for an award. So he said, hey, would you write a letter? I said, I would be delighted to write a letter. You know, by the way, do you ever talk to your students about open source? And that's how this thing started. Just asking that simple question, question uh, just asking that, you know, opening that door is really how this unfolded. Right, how I ended up uh, teaching a class. It was, uh, the answer was no, we don't really talk about open source. Do you know anything about that? Because I think my students would like to hear it. I said, yeah, I, I know a thing or two. Let's, you know, let's talk. And it, it grew from there. Uh, ApacheCon Denver was in 2014. Thank you, Gavin. Did I say Denver? It might have been Austin. I, I don't remember. So let's talk about the hard thing. The, the really hard part about delivering an open source curriculum is really designing the curriculum itself. This is where, this is a big surprise for me. It, it totally took me off guard uh, because I figured, you know, hey, we'll, we'll just kind of show up. Uh, we'll talk about open source. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be awesome. And what I realized very quickly is that uh, when, you, when you give a class, you're signing up for X number of 50 minutes or sometimes hour and a half long presentations. Uh, and that that kind of hit me, you know, the hard way. And, and I, I took a step back and I said, okay, well, shoot, how are we gonna do this? What are we gonna do? Um, oh, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm running down the path. Let me, let me take a step back. Where might you teach this class? Or where might you do this? Um, it can be difficult to find a start as I kind of mentioned, the, the start landed in my lap. Keep an eye out for that sort of thing. Use your personal network and your professional network. Another way to do this, uh, and, and this is actually um, how I got involved in the, I forget the name of the, uh, uh, the programming club at one of the local colleges, but 
I showed up one day uh, to talk about the Apache Software Foundation to give the Apache Way presentation, and it just kind of grew from there, right? You, you, you gain the interest. People ask more questions. You say, "Well, hey, I can come back." You know, "Hey, I could do a lunch and learn, or maybe something like that for your faculty." What do you think? Uh, another great way to do this is speak at a conference, just like this. So. I'll tell you what, here, I'll make a deal. We have a handful of people now in the session. Everybody here uh, is going to use my call to action of going out and they're going to try to uh, land a job as an adjunct instructor uh, for one semester teaching a class. And next year, I'd love to see you guys present here on how you did it, right? That'll be the, uh, that'll be the goal. I see Rob Tompkins, he's, he's already starting, he's already working on it. So that's gonna be great. Um, Rob, I would love to hear about your experiences, and, and please reach out, use me as a resource. So anyhow, back to talking about curriculum. This is the hard part. Uh, and believe it or not, there is actually some open source data, open source information uh, that you can use, right? Uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, I structured my class, uh, I structured the curriculum heavily on Chani Yoon's open source class that you can see on the Google Code um, uh, site that he operates. There's also a terrific amount of, of just really good open source documentation uh, right here in the community track, which we're, we're hanging out in, community.apache.org. That's a great place. Just start browsing in things that seem interesting to you. Uh, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Carl's excellent book about producing open source. It's it's free to download. Uh, your students will love you if you use this as a textbook for your class because you don't have to go spend uh, you know two hundred dollars uh, or whatever the current charge is for uh, a book. So starting with that information, some of the things that you really want to hit. Uh, keep the schedule kind of in mind. Uh, think about where the semester breaks are. Think about, uh, you know, you have your big areas to focus on. What are the things that build on previous topics? Uh, and what are the things that will, uh, you know, maybe stand alone that, you know, you might be able to slide that into the schedule just before semester break or something like that. Um, a really critical thing, I've taught this session, I've taught the, the open source type class uh, to two sizes of classes. I've, I've had 30 students and I've had seven students. Um, depending on your style, depending on how you'd like to give the session, you're going to tweak a couple of things, right? If you have a larger class or, or maybe even a very interactive group, uh, consider bringing guest speakers. Um, you know, I mentioned Rich earlier. He, he came and actually spoke at one of my, uh, uh, one of my sessions as a guest speaker and the students loved it. Uh, in fact, I think, Rich, we, we invited the whole Information Systems Programming Club to that one. I think we had a, a few extra participants. Um, also consider, especially if you're using a, uh, a textbook, you know, to prepare your readings in advance. Uh, a great reading that I like to ask students to take a look at is The Cathedral and the Bazaar, right? A lot of us have read that book. It's a, it's a really good introduction. Um, the other thing, one of the requirements I had when I was delivering the course at Washington University is we really wanted the students also to engage in a project of their own. Some of the students actually open source their project. Um, I think we, in the industry, we tend to call those abandonware because after they graduated, they didn't maintain it, but you know, whatever. Um, but this was actually an interesting dynamic for us because we also asked the students to present. Uh, you know, we were we were in the School of Business at UM St. Louis, and I, I made it a point to uh, let folks know, hey, uh, when you get out into the, the big world of business or when you get out into industry, you're going to be asked to do some presentations. You're going to be asked to, um, you know, talk to maybe non-technical folks. Prep for that. I think that is invaluable for students to do, so consider that, uh, you know, it maybe isn't so much fun for them, but you know, balance fun versus what they need. Uh, another thing to consider, how are you going to measure a student's success? How are you going to know that your student is, they're getting it, right? Uh, it's, you know, it, it's super easy. I, I say it's hard to grade 
based on memory. Uh, and I say it's hard because you're not really necessarily getting a good evaluation. Uh, if you're basing strictly on memory, you're, you're not necessarily understanding if the student like gets it, if they truly understand the concepts, uh, or if they're just, you know, reading the study guide and repeating it and regurgitating it up onto the uh, test itself. So think about how you might evaluate the students. And what I usually did in those cases, I would ask leading questions uh, and, and interact more with the students. Obviously, that's going to work really well in a small class size, not so much in a really big class size, unless you set aside some individual time for your students. So think about different ways that you could uh, evaluate the students, right? I tossed a few criteria up on the screen. Um, you know, the, again, most of the folks that are, are in the room we, we've met, you know, I'm very interactive. I like to talk. I use my hands when I speak. Uh, participation was really big for me. So I would often drag students into the discussion to kind of gauge in real time their understanding uh, because it, you know, provided me the value of knowing is the material I'm presenting being understood or, or you know, able to be reflected by the student? Do I need to adjust how I do it? Uh, or is Timmy just not awake and I need to wake him up and pull him into the conversation? Um, so that's, that's another area, right? So the curriculum's one part and then evaluations is another area to kind of keep in mind. So let me talk about what I've done, uh, at least with, with the session or the, the, uh, the, the classes that I've given, um, the curriculum contents are things that I, I think are, um, you know, the, like I said, super important. Uh, and, and what I've done effectively for, uh, based on uh, previous examples, right, uh, I've taken this, this basic syllabus and fleshed it out into different lesson plans. And I'm going to do something that they tell you never to do. I'm going to do a, a live demo. All right, you ready? I have the screen open. Here is the GitHub repo. It's very simple. Um, hop in here, take a look around. This is actually something that, uh, thank you to the Apache Community Development Project. I shared on the com comdev list a couple of years ago that, hey, I'm, I'm looking to put this together. And a number of people stopped in, you know, they popped into the repo. You can see that we have 29 contributors. People have made, you know, suggestions. People have made improvements. A lot of typos have been corrected. Uh, I even gave my students bonus points if they corrected anything that was factually incorrect. Um, but you can see two iterations of the syllabus here. Uh, so poke around in there. The interesting part really, I think, is the lecture notes where we, you know, we take a single topic and build it out into an outline of how that class will be delivered. So I'll put it back over here. Um, again, these these are real world examples that have worked for me. They've worked for you know the students. They have they have actually worked in other contexts. Uh, I've given some of these sessions. I, I assume a lot of folks here are participating in training programs at work. Um, there have been times where we might have interns come along or, you know, junior folks that are trying to understand what is CICD. Uh, and, and I always refer back to these lesson plans. It's just, you know, let's kind of talk about those things. Uh, let's, let's take this and, and run through it. And then, you know, maybe there are new questions or, or something that, you know, I, I hadn't considered before. I always kind of feed it back into those markdown files. So as I mentioned, you know, that, that's a, a good skeleton. Use it, it's, it's yours. You're going to deliver this class and I want it to be as a simple and easy process as possible for you. Um, consider also adding or subtracting guest speakers uh, and readings. I mentioned the Cathedral and the Bazaar, uh, classic, classic document that, you know, very early days of open source. Um, I mentioned guest speakers. Uh, I actually, in, our, in the first iteration of the class, we had guest speakers on the opposite ends of the spectrum, kind of give their perspective. Uh, one person talking about, you know, the benefits or the reasons that open source is, you know, you should do open source because it is just good to do. And then on the other side, we had a person uh, present and say, you should do open source because you get free labor and it's a business decision. Uh, it, very interesting um, differing opinions uh, for the students to hear. So. 
uh, consider that sort of thing. Um, I'll again point out, I, I'm more than happy to uh, present, give guidance. Uh, I can even connect those interested with some of my own network if they would like to uh, do this sort of thing. So, you know, like I said, use me as a reference or a resource, uh, and I'm happy to refer you to other folks that might be able to augment the open source class that you might give. Uh, because I don't know if I'll be able to do this again. I, you know, recently uh, took a new role and it's been super busy. So uh, somebody carry the torch, right? So I'd normally kind of pause for questions, but, uh, you know, I'm talking to a camera uh, and, and many friends of mine are on the other end of the camera, but uh, it's not as interactive. So I'll just kind of plow through. And then when we get to the end, you know, open for uh, whatever you have in mind. So I've kind of grabbed a few things that I think are very, very important topics to consider. Uh, I think I have two slides of these. The, the first, and, and I think that probably the most important, arguably to give students a, a true appreciation of open source is the history of open source. When you look at the different reasons people started doing or are doing open source, there are you know, four discrete different reasons. I'll leave it as a, uh, uh, an exercise for the reader to take a look at the um, syllabus to see what those four reasons are. But you know, getting, getting students familiar with that history, uh, I think, provides a richness and a very good foundation to build the rest of this. Um, moving further, you know, we also need to remember that we have to teach our students concrete, hard skills, uh, tooling. Guys, you know, we, we in the open source world have invented tooling to augment our ability to deliver software. Think about it. Source control, build management, bugs and issue trackers. These are things that any software development student, any business student even, will need to understand and have some sort of exposure to. So these are things that really need to be in place. Uh, they really should, you know, highlight uh, or have a highlighted spot within the curriculum. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of the reasons why that's the case in my mind. Um, depending on what area your students are studying, uh, the different development processes might be important to cover, right? Uh, I, I found that the students are totally on board. They totally get the whole Kanban uh, kind of thought process. When I when I tried to explain to them waterfall, they they got a little confused and they said that sounds awful. So I guess we as an industry are, you know, progressing well on that front. Um, it's also important, especially if your students will be participating in open source, to talk about development best practices. Uh, there will be times that they might go back to contribute uh, and depending on the community that they are engaging in, they may not have a good experience if they forgot to update the readme. I'll let you fill in the blanks on what that might mean for some of the communities that are out there, but uh, they should definitely understand these things. And then a, a favorite topic, I think this is important for open source. Um, it, it's obviously critical to the Apache Software Foundation, so maybe that kind of slants my view. But let's talk about communities. Let's talk about governance. Let's talk about how do things happen within the different projects. Uh, this is an entire hour and a half long session, sometimes two hours uh, that you can you can run through here with your students. And uh, it, it's interesting because when we started talking about that, uh, communities and governance particularly, and then licenses as well, the students were very fascinated. I was surprised by how interested they were in some of the softer side of the, uh, the, the platform. Um, rather than some of the hard you know, technical skills like source control uh, and things like that. Um, getting involved is another important one and that, that kind of feeds into communities and governance. I would tend to recommend teaching communities and governance so people can understand you know, the way I get involved with uh, an open governance model is gonna be very different from the way I get involved with a open source closed governance type of model, that makes sense. Uh, and I found that hands-on labs and doing even goofy exercises that, you know, it, it, in the grand scheme of things don't necessarily matter, but using some of the tools, that's a really important thing to do. Get, get the students on the keyboard trying some of these things out because um, 
you, you'll be surprised at, at how sometimes they have issues with uh, some of the tooling. So I'm going to jump to the next slide. Uh, before I before I touch on that, uh, Sharon asked a good question. So developers are getting younger and younger. Um, is there a minimum age I would recommend a class for? And I'm going to say no. I, I wouldn't really have a minimum age because you be the judge, right? You know your audience better than I would. It may be a bit lost, you know, not not lost. It probably wouldn't be effective use of time to teach 11 year olds about license and open source and intellectual property legal implications. Um, but they're definitely going to be interested in uh, logical flows, right? How do you how do you make computers do stuff like that? So I my my opinion would be find ways to work open source into any audience. Uh, you'll find it, you'll understand it. Um, I've had to explain to my kids a handful of times why why I engage in open source, what am I doing, why, what is that black screen with the white text, what is all that stuff, dad, talk to me. Um, and it, I've been receiving those questions as young as, you know, eight or nine years old. So um, I don't know if we ever really got into the uh, intrinsic motivational factors that you would see in, you know, a public good type of charity contribution, um, but at least the interest was there. So I, I would say expose the students early to it. Um, for a full-on curriculum, I would suggest uh, no sooner than high school, probably um, 10th, 10th or 11th grade uh, at a minimum, because, you know, there's a lot of complex topics that we would cover if we were doing an entire semester on open source. Um, so think about additional things that you might work into your curriculum. Uh, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, for a team project, this, is, uh, it, this will fit in very well with just about any computer science curriculum. I remember my capstone class uh, of, my, of my undergraduate degree was to design and deploy an actual system for a real world client. Um, that can be the underlying theme or the, the backbone, I would say, of what you need to do in the class. But then as you work on that, you can expose and teach students all of these open source topics. That's actually what we did at Washington University when I, I did the session uh, there, is we would, we would kind of set milestones uh, and we would have the students kind of self-govern their team projects. But then the bulk of class time was spent. We had hour and 15 minute classes. The bulk of class time was spent talking about these open source concepts, exposing the students to them, gauging their understanding and things like that. Um, the, the, the caution that I'll give you is uh, be careful uh, on overloading students. And I kind of mentioned this here. Um, if you're going to give them a very heavy duty project that they need to complete by the end of the semester, uh, you may have to kind of take the easy way out on some of your evaluations for open source understanding. Um, you, cognitive overload is a real thing, and we don't want to burn our students out. And of course, at the end of the day, we want everybody to succeed. Um, a, a thing I strongly suggest for any student is giving individual presentations. Um, two that I've, I've had students do uh, is, you know, tell me about your favorite open source project. And I made it, you know, the, the criteria, and I, you'll see this in some of the, the syllabi that are up on the page. Um, I made it about open source as well. Tell me about the project. Now, what is that project's governance model? How does that project sustain itself through contributions, through funds? Uh, what's the licensing that that project has? Tell me things about that. Uh, and that can also serve not just not just the the horrible thing that a lot of us hated in secondary school of giving presentations, um, but it also kind of causes the students to internalize some of these concepts that they're hearing as they talk about their particular project. Um, one of my favorite ones, and I'll, I'll tell you generally in my experience, this is usually a miss more than a hit with students, is how do how do you make money with open source? Um, there are a couple of different valid models out there. Um, I, I think either I didn't do a great job of explaining them to the students, or maybe that's a little obscure of a topic to have them present on, uh, but it was a fun exercise nonetheless. Uh, and then, you know, I'm going to work this in here, writing assignments. 
Um, at some point in all of our careers, we're going to have to explain something technical or complicated in a non-complicated way. That is a muscle that everybody should learn and build. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with open source per se, uh, but that is something that we do need to be teaching the next generation. I think it was Einstein maybe it was who said, uh, uh, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. Feel free to correct that citation. I, I think that's correct. So giving the curriculum, I wanted to cover a couple of things that were surprising and not surprising and then surprising for the students. Um, the things that are not surprising, I'm going to say them to make sure that you hear them and they're in uh, black or grayish and white. Uh, students don't always do the readings and sometimes they don't show up for class. It can be hard to gauge that until it's a little too late. For example, if you are setting a schedule for your lecture, or you're, you're planning for an interactive session with the students and you get 20 minutes in and you realize nobody has done the required reading and they have no idea what you're talking about, uh, you'll have to deal with that, right? Um, be aware of that, uh, have a backup plan. Um, I assume we've all kind of been there before where maybe we didn't do the best of uh, keeping up on the required readings. The other unsurprising thing is, you know, m many students, I would say most, have not really been exposed to open source. What is it really, right? I mean, people, uh, I think people generally understand open source means I can go get this free as in beer. Um, they may not understand the whole free as in free speech type of thing, but uh, generally speaking, they, they don't necessarily know the whole ecosystem. This is a vast and vibrant ecosystem, so that shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, and that's why we're here, right? We we are going to teach this next generation about this ecosystem. And Rob's gonna tell me all about it next year. Um, it, it's also a little difficult to find the right mix between in-class and out-of-class learning. This is like required readings or writing outside of class versus you talking with the students during class. Uh, again, my personal style is I like a very conversational uh, type of presentation. So I, I tend to just use the notes, right, that you'll find in the, uh, the, the syllabus um, or in the lecture notes, I should say. And then we just kind of take the conversation wherever it goes. You use the notes as a, a skeleton. Uh, the other part, and this is, this is just the fact of, of learning, uh, students will miss nuances, something that you and I take for granted or we just intrinsically understand. Um, they don't necessarily understand yet why that is significant. So it, it can fly right by them. Uh, repetition will be important. What was surprising for me, and these are some of the things that I wanted to share, um, learning Git is actually quite hard for first timers, actually any form of version control. Um, if, you, if you think back to your days as a uh, university student, um, or, or if you got engaged in software development before that. I, I don't know about you guys, but I saved all these files locally on my disk and sometimes I would copy them to a server. But this whole commit, uh, a chain of commits and a uh, repository that holds these and other people working, what, that, that was insane. Um, students, the, the students have, have consistently struggled with this. Uh, so I, I definitely suggest lab time, uh, you know, repetition, you know, talking about version control uh, is definitely something that not just is important, it's a hard skill that is required these days. Um, you will need to spend some extra attention on some topics. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the session, make sure you save, you know, save an empty class or two, because there will be things that need to spill and you may need to, you know, kind of juggle the schedule just a little bit to make sure you give something appropriate coverage. Um, it, it was also kind of surprising to me, uh, if you are very open and transparent about how you will grade, students will deliver exactly according to the grade, um, which can be unexpected, right? Uh, keep that in mind. Um, finally, the other thing that I, I thought was kind of surprising, generally speaking, the students, even in the senior year uh, of 
a software engineering type of degree, um, they they don't necessarily understand the full software development life cycle. So I will uh, uh, I will definitely recommend covering the life cycle of software development from conceptualization all the way to release, and then day two, you know, issues and tracking and stuff like that. So I did want to share a couple of things that I, I, I gathered were surprising for the students, and most of these are great. Um, open source is more than GitHub. This is something that, you know, I consistently could kind of see it dawn uh, on the students' faces as we would talk about these concepts. And they're like, oh, it's just not a place that people dump code. Cool. Let's learn more about this. Um, the other thing I found really fascinating, so I, I've taught this uh, this session in the School of Business and in the School of Computer Science, and consistently these uh, these students have been very interested in licensing and intellectual property. Um, it was it was a a very interesting conversation when we got around to licenses. It was funny the first time I taught the class when I would reference the licenses talk. Uh, I would always say that talk that you guys are going to fall asleep in, and it turned out to be the exact opposite. The students were super engaged. They were really interested. Uh, they challenged a lot of the you know, uh, things that they heard. Um, so I would say as, as you give your sessions, make sure that you're pretty well buttoned up on that particular area because the level of engagement for licensing and IP was, was really cool. Um, another thing that was kind of surprising for students, I would say, is writing for a non-technical manager is hard you know it's it, i i think this is maybe the third time in this session particularly that i've kind of called this out this is a skill that they will need to build muscle for and i guess it's it's easy to kind of internalize it but to repeat back in a way that maybe isn't uh understood to the level that you have that's a challenge uh and then finally of course the most uh, exciting thing that I saw students pick up and exciting, you know, for me is that students realize that they can participate to open source. Uh, guys, one of one of the most rewarding things I I experienced during delivery of this course is, uh, you know, I, I, I can see his face. I can I can remember the tone in his voice when he shared at the beginning of class that he fixed a documentation bug in his favorite JavaScript library. And he never would have thought to do that if it weren't for the fact that we talked about these things. So he fixed the documentation bug. Of course, you know, being who I am, I announced that the whole class, everybody clapped and you, you could just sense the moment of, of, of pride. So that was really cool. And, and to see the students kind of pick that up and get that they can do that, uh, very, very great. Um, wrapping up fairly quickly, I have only like a minute, but again, questions are certainly welcome. You know how to get a hold of me. Um, look, guys, you can do this. Uh, any one of us can do this. Any one of us who have the passion, uh, the experience, uh, anything along those lines, this passion is what makes it happen. Um, build upon the foundation that I, I won't even say that I have provided because I built upon uh, existing curriculum. Let's do this the way we do open source software. Let's keep building and the next iteration will be that much better. Uh, and, and then finally, guys, this is, you know, this is Apache Con. You know, we're all about community over code. This is how you can give back to the community. The things that you have learned, sometimes through a mentor, sometimes through the hard way, you can give back to the next generation. So go for it. Do it. Reach out to me. I'm more than happy to talk with you. Uh, you know, even if it's a phone call. I, I do those. We can do phone calls. We can do Skype chats. We can do emails, whatever. Uh, I want to enable people to be able to do this because I personally, again, got so much out of giving. Um, so with that, I'll kind of end. Um, we'll, we'll play the uh, applause track in the back. Uh, and I'll pause for any questions if we have time, Sharon. My friend Prashant has, has uh, volunteered to be a guest speaker as a uh, more community, less code guy, um, preventing, <laughs> preventing burnout. Uh, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and plug his, uh, his talk that's coming up. Uh, Prashant will talk about um, mindfulness and, and managing burnout. And I think if there's ever a time 
uh, it's now that we should all think about those things. Thanks for sharing. Okay, I think uh, I think we'll call it good. Um, I see that my 3D print has completely destroyed itself in the background. Uh, so I'm going to go tend to that. And uh, again, guys, reach out to me. Uh, let me know how I can help or uh, feel free to uh, just meet up with me in the hallway track. I'll be hanging out there as well. Thank you all.